and welcome to the Jewish Geography Podcast. This is Eitan Levy, your host. I'm sorry, I've been out for a while. Finally got a free few hours here where both the kids are out of the house and I'm not out uh, touring around the land of Israel. So I wanted to put my two cents in about what's been going on lately over the last few weeks here in the land of Israel and concerning Israel around the world. So the big couple of things going on have been the Hanukkah holiday. Of course, that uh, started back on December 13th and it just ended yesterday. But I want to wish you a belated uh, happy Hanukkah. Hope you had a good holiday. And uh, for Jews, we're not going into our new year now, but for those of you who celebrate other holidays this season of the year and uh, and the secular new year. Happy New Year and happy holidays to whatever you may be celebrating. Another thing that happened is that Donald Trump declared Jerusalem to be the capital of the state of Israel. Huh. Shocking, right? Uh, of course, you know, anybody I imagine listening to this podcast was well aware that Jerusalem is, in fact, the capital of Israel, regardless of any political niceties that any foreign leaders or politicians or negotiators or whatnot might float. And for those of us in Israel, this is just a very welcome recognition of a reality which is so clear and so obvious and so just an objective fact of reality that the relentless uh, lack of recognition of uh, a simple reality, which is as true as gravity, uh, well, maybe not, because I guess, uh, in theory, who's in charge here could change. But the obvious part of it is it's as obvious as that Paris is the capital of France or Washington, D.C. is the capital of the United States. It's an obvious fact that Jerusalem is, in fact, the capital of Israel and The idea that recognizing that is somehow changing the status quo in any meaningful way is a bit absurd, given that, practically speaking, everyone already recognizes Jerusalem as our capital. Uh, Foreign dignitaries, presidents, etc., etc., they all come to Jerusalem to meet with members of our government. And the very idea that it's not the place where our government sits and no one recognizes it, you know, they refuse to meet with our officials there or something, it's absurd. Everybody recognizes that West Jerusalem is Israel and would be Israel under any conceivable deal that might be struck. There's no possibility, according to any deal that has ever been negotiated since 1948, even in potential, that West Jerusalem would cease to be the capital of Israel. And therefore, this is a dropping of an illusion uh, that the world has been holding out for too long. And I want to tell you why I think it matters, because it doesn't really change anything. And why does it matter? So there's a couple of things. One is, uh, one is geopolitical, and one is personal. It, or personal to the Jewish people, I should say. The geopolitical reason that it matters is that from the perspective of us here in Israel, this is an obvious truth. And obviously any Palestinian entity which fails to recognize that Jerusalem is and will remain our capital city, whether uh, completely united or split, uh, if anyone refusing to recognize that is clearly someone who cannot negotiate any sort of deal with us. So any sort of end of the conflict is completely impossible with people refusing to recognize that. And what we see uh, in response to the declaration that Trump made is that the Palestinian Authority continues to reject any such suggestion. And therefore, we see the reason why the 
multiple offers of statehood that were given to the Palestinians were rejected uh, on the grounds that uh, the continued existence of Israel essentially is the qualm that they have uh, with those solutions. And our presence at all in any of Jerusalem, uh, not to speak of Jaffa and Haifa, which if you look at uh, the maps published in Palestinian Authority, schools are still shown as cities which are meant to be reclaimed by Palestine, which will be from the river to the sea, uh, as uh, as the, you know, students for justice in Palestine, etc., and groups like that chant, you know, from the river to the sea, Palestine shall be free. Well, what does that tell you? What does it mean for them to be free? It means for them to murder the six million Jews who live here and uh, take over the country. Or uh, if we want to imagine possibly that they'll have human rights qualms, you know, just allow us to live here as second class citizens in yet another failed Islamic state. So it's a ridiculous idea that peace is possible with this entity uh, at any time in the near future. Uh, I don't think this particularly makes peace with the Palestinians directly more possible, but I don't think that any dropping of pretense and illusions and uh, outright uh, diplomatic lies is going to be harmful in the long run. Uh, I think what we've seen so far as a result has been a pretty pathetic uptick in violence in response to all the calls for rage and the third intifada and blah 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 i think that um, the palestinian people are as sick of the cries of their leaders to take up arms against a sea of troubles which are largely those leaders making uh, i think they're as sick of that as many israelis and many people around the world are so thank god uh whatever uh, one thinks about Donald Trump and his particular uh, domestic politics in the U.S., and I'm not a huge fan for a number of reasons, one of which being that I think character matters, and uh, I don't think his is so great. Uh, but all those things aside, this is a positive thing. Donald Trump is taking down illusions which lead Palestinians to feel that they have the possibility within their grasp to kick us out of here, and by setting up what uh, Jab Zev Jabotinsky, one of the early uh, theorists of modern Zionism, who was the ideological founder of the right-wing Etzel uh, bloc that later became the foundation for uh, what is today uh, the right-wing government led by Likud. Uh, the Likud faction is essentially a descendant of his. He, he said that for Jews to survive in this area, it would require an iron wall. And what does that mean? He said, to think that we can come in here, we have two groups of people who have claims on the same piece of land, to think that if we just give them money and... Uh, help make their standard of living a bit higher, to think that for that, the Palestinian Arabs, the Arabs living in, at that time, Palestine, which referred to both, Palestinian referred to both Jews and Arabs at the time, the, Palis the Arab citizens of Palestine of the time, to think that they would just give up and be happy with a sort of second tier uh, status living inside a Jewish state, uh, which is by whichever means it would be established, uh, to think they could be so easily bought off was infantilizing them and was underestimating them, essentially a form of racism. And that, no, he said that Arabs are people who have honor, they have a sense of their own honor, and they will not uh, give in quietly to this situation. The only way to get peace, therefore, is not to pretend that this is a situation that we can just buy them off, but rather to show clearly that it is impossible for the Arabs to ever conquer Israel, to ever destroy Israel, and therefore that they will give up and live with a situation which is not ideal from their perspective. And that is essentially what this declaration from Donald Trump is doing. Uh, I, I hate to say it because I, I know some people uh, still have more optimistic views about this part of the world, but some things are zero-sum, and 
some things require one group of people to maintain control over an area, uh, <laughs> and that comes at the expense of another group of people. You know, they, if you, and if you want to argue that, uh, you know, democracy is not being served by this, um, I wouldn't necessarily disagree. But the ideal of democracy uh, doesn't really function very well when you have two ethnic groups, which are one of which is perfectly happy to kill the other uh, if they ever get the chance. So uh, under these circumstances, uh, maintaining our control in this region and uh, Jewish sovereignty, not just Jewish presence, but a Jewish sovereignty over the land of Israel, the entire land of Israel, is militarily uh, required. And that's all aside from the second part of what I wanted to say, which is that I was touring the other day with a, uh, a client, uh, who uh, Jenna, from Toronto, uh, and she mentioned that she's a relationship therapist and that almost all of the problems human beings have between each other have to do with wanting to be recognized and honored, acknowledged, I don't remember the exact wording she used, but something to that effect. And, uh, or what my wife might call, my wife Daniela might call being seen in a deep sense. And from Israel's perspective, this is being seen. This is, this is the reality. This is who we are. This has been our capital for 3,000 years since King David established it, marching, singing, and dancing up from Kiryat Yarim, to Jerusalem, bringing the Ark of the Covenant to the city and declaring it the capital and preparing the ground for the place where the temple would be built. Since that time, we have never stopped either praying in or praying for a Jewish presence in Jerusalem, and not just a presence, but dominion, sovereignty, control, that according to God's law, this little tiny really minuscule, if you look at a, a world map, piece of land, belongs to the people that God chose to give it to, and that is the Jewish people. The holiday of Hanukkah is a great reminder of this. You know, when you walk down from the Jewish quarter towards the Western Wall, towards the Western Wall Plaza, you see a giant, let's say, replica of the menorah that was built by the Temple Institute. And I always stop there and I ask people, why do you think... Why do you think that the menorah is the symbol that the government of, let's say, that, that Jerusalem, the old city here, decided to, to give uh, this square to the Temple Institute so that they could put this symbol in front of people as they walk down and approach the Western Wall, our holiest site, which is easily accessible in the land of Israel? Why is that? And I like to bring out a picture of the Arch of Titus and show them the picture it's famous from the Arch of Titus that was created for the triumph. And the way, uh, sorry, the, the, it was created for the triumph that Titus did in Rome following the destruction of the temple in 70 when he returned to Rome. The way a triumph was held was that the troops and the general would wait across the Tiber River for weeks or even months, while the city prepared for this massive multi-day party, which included a march of the army and with its many slaves and booty and everything through the capital, through this arch that had been prepared. And the arch was decorated with uh, depictions of you know, the, the great deeds and bravery, etc., of the Roman general and the troops and, and everything uh, to be you know, a monument to them forever. And on the Arch of Titus, you have a picture of a bunch of people in togas uh, carrying a carrying the menorah, a, seven, a large seven-branched candelabra. But this candelabra is clearly not a direct replica of the real menorah, meaning two things. One, whoever made it had never seen it. Uh, probably it was 
you know, more likely it was melted down for gold if they took it at all. Uh, and in any case, it was, even if it was with them, with the soldiers, the artist probably hadn't seen it because it actually hadn't happened yet. The scene he was depicting had not happened yet. He was drawing it from his imagination, and I can tell you that because he drew a bunch of little animal figures around the base of it, which is a clear prohibition of the commandment against graven images, and thus clearly forbidden, and would not be the case, would not be really what was there. So it's an inaccurate depiction, but it does tell you one thing, and that is that this artist wanted to tell his illiterate Roman viewers that these people that you see on the arch, these people are... Jews, because the six-pointed star is a medieval European association with Jews and is not an ancient symbol, has nothing to do with David, that's a complete after-the-fact made-up thing. But the menorah, the seven-branched candelabra that was lit in the temple, that was already at the times of the Romans, and probably, and most likely, and as we understand also from the time of the Maccabees a couple hundred years earlier, this was already the universally recognized and acknowledged symbol of the Jewish people. So, as the artist wanted to symbolize, wanted to let his audience know that these were Jews, these people in togas, that dressed more or less like any other Mediterranean people of the time, you know, some sort of sheet wrapped around them with a belt holding it together, he wanted to let them in on the fact that these people were Jews, and so he stamped a menorah on it. And that brings us back to today. So the menorah continues today to be a symbol of the Jewish people. But for the same reason that the rabbis in establishing the Hanukkah holiday, the symbolic reasons that they chose the menorah as the symbol, you know, there's a lot of discussion in the Talmud and in the rabbinic literature over the last over the last couple thousand years about the meaning of Hanukkah, and it became a thing that was focused much more on the spiritual aspect of the battle, and I think that's that's right and good. That's the way it should be, but. Uh, it was almost entirely to the exclusion of sort of the victories in battle, which is part of the original prayer we say. All through Hanukkah, we add a little additional prayer to our daily prayers, to our grace after meals and everything. And it includes a very explicit uh, thanking of God, uh, it seems, from the wording, primarily for the military victory. And yes, with this miracle of the oil lasting for eight days at the end of it. Uh, it seems that these two things clearly were meant to go together, the thanking of God for the military victory, the reestablishment of the temple as the crown on the head of that victory, and the light of the Hanukkah menorah representing the primeval light of creation that God is bringing into the world, and that Judaism properly practiced with uh, our center in Jerusalem, in Zion, hence the word Zionism, is the fulfillment of. And uh, that, that this, uh, this light is meant to come out from Jerusalem to the world. From Zion will come out the Torah to the world. And when we look at it today, we realize that there's a reason that the Maccabees used the menorah as a symbol on their coinage, and why the rebels against Rome, both in the Great Revolt and in the Bar Kokhba Revolt, used, among other symbols, the menorah as one of their symbols on their coinage and on their iconography. And a reason why it's, main, it's remained such a powerful symbol ever since, because the menorah is a unique symbol of a religion, of a group of people, but it's not of a religion, so to speak. It's of a, it's of a place. It's of a particular practice. It is a representation of the Jewish people practicing their religion in their land. The trifecta of the people of Israel, the land of Israel, and the Torah of Israel, the three points that I try to bring home to people anywhere I take them in the land of Israel, on every trip, 
and I hope it gets through also on this podcast. It is the combination of these three factors together, the people in the land following the laws of God and reaching, straining to connect to the divine and connect between heaven and earth. That is the mission of the Jewish people. And it can only be fulfilled here in our land. And the menorah, the real menorah, will again one day stand on the Temple Mount in the place of the t- in the temple. But for now, we have to make do with it as a symbol. And on Hanukkah is a time when we spend eight days connecting to that symbol, the nine-branched candelabras that we use, or you know, eight-branched plus a candle, uh, as the shamash, as the, the one that you use to light the others is meant to be reminiscent of the menorah. It's meant to make you think of the original menorah that happened with the miracle, but to fulfill the, but to fulfill the, uh, the mitzvah of Hanukkah, which is to light for eight days and continuing to add light each day. So we do that. And, uh, just a quick note that it's actually, uh, Jewish law doesn't allow us to use perfect replicas of the menorah in our homes. So uh, that's that's uh, those little replicas of the menorah, the seven-branched, perfectly even candelabras that people buy uh, that are meant to look like the one in the temple. Those are uh, You generally will not see those uh, in, in Orthodox homes or, or synagogues. Uh, but the Hanukkah, a Hanukkah menorah, is meant to evoke that imagery and connect us to to our desire to bring that light back to its original place, personhood, embodiedness in the land and people of Israel. And that's what we hope to do. So, you know, thank God, uh, despite, <laughs> again, despite all my qualms and misgivings about Donald Trump and, uh, you know, they, are, they have not been greatly relieved over the last year. <laughs> unfortunately, but that's beside the point. Uh, when something, when someone does something good, we need to respect it and acknowledge it. So I want to say thank you to the president of the United States for recognizing an obvious truth for helping to hopefully disillusion those who would wish to destroy us and see our presence here as temporary and our defeat and destruction as inevitable. And I want to thank you, listener, for your ongoing support for the people of Israel in the land of Israel, serving God according to the Torah of Israel. And I want to wish you all a winter full of light. And on that note, we're going to go out with uh, me and my family singing Maos Tzu on the second night of Hanukkah, which was now over a week ago. Thank you so much for listening until this point. I know it's been a bit of a rant, and uh, I really appreciate it. If you'd like to support the podcast, please go to Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Rabbi Eitan, and uh, give uh, a monthly donation of whatever you see fit, whatever you can afford. It's greatly appreciated. And uh, if we can get up even a little bit closer to our um, initial goal of $500 a month, then I will be able to dedicate more time to this and uh, please God be able to put out an episode every week. But for now, this is going to have to do. And uh, please God, I'll, I'll be back on the mic again in a week or two. In the meantime, thanks for listening. And have a good winter. Hanukkah, 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 Hanukkah,